Hey there, John. How you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm hanging in there. How are you doing, Glenn? I'm doing okay. Welcome to the Glenn Show. Pleasure to be here. I am indeed Glenn Lowry, uh, Brown University Department of Economics and the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. This is the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. And it's my pleasure to be talking with John Shields, who's Associate Professor of Government at Claremont McKenna College out there in California, and author of a book, Trump's Democrats, that we are here to discuss. Uh, so, John, uh, let me not uh, try to tell people what this book is about. I think the title is uh, very indicative of uh, the general area of inquiry. Uh, you're trying to figure out who these Democrats are who voted for Donald Trump in 2016 and what that all means for the future of American politics. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your project? The book is joint, I should say, with Stephanie Moravich. Moravchek. Moravchek. I beg your pardon, Stephanie. But uh, anyway, uh, John, good to be talking to you about your book. Uh, what are you guys up to? Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Uh, well, the origins of this book, you know, began on election night in 2016. And, and uh, you know, that was one of the most surprising political events of my lifetime. And, and really my surprise, our surprise, really deepened in the weeks and days that followed because we discovered that there were many uh, Obama counties, 206 of them, that flipped and voted for Trump. And as we dug deeper, we discovered that many of these places had not just voted for Obama, but they had been loyal to the Democratic Party for a long time. So, you know, there's nearly 100 counties that had not voted uh, for a Republican since the 80s. Others had not voted for uh, a Republican president since uh, 72, you know, when they flipped for Reagan. And then there was a handful of places, Glenn, that um, that um, had really pretty unbroken records of voting for Democratic presidential candidates, stretching really back before the New Deal. In fact, there was one place, this is really astonishing, there was one place uh, that had never voted for a Republican in the history of the county since it was formed in the 19th century. And, you know, we're, we're accustomed to talking about the, uh, or thinking about this, uh, the Nixon Democrats uh, and the Reagan Democrats, but the Trump Democrats are much more interesting because, you know, uh, Reagan and Nixon won in landslides. And so it's not surprising that there are a lot of places that flipped and, you know, uh, and, and a lot of Democratic places that voted for them. But in 2016, it wasn't a landslide. In fact, it was just the opposite, right? I mean, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote and nonetheless managed to win some of the most loyal blue communities in the nation. And so to us, that was just a fascinating an interesting puzzle. And then the second thing I'll say really quickly by way of an introduction about the book is that um, there were, the explanations that were floating around out there um, seemed to us really unsatisfying. Uh, you know, and, and, and they all had, they, and, and we were unsatisfied with them because they all assumed that there's something must be deeply wrong with these people, right? They're, they're either proto-fascist because they're authoritarian or they're racist or they have status anxiety or they've got various diseases of social despair. And we wondered if that the assumption that there must be something wrong with these voters was in part a symptom of our social and cultural isolation from these places. Uh, so we, we wanted to really um, not, so we, we didn't begin with the assumption that there was some kind of psychological cleavage, right, that separated blue communities like the leafy college town we live in, in here in Claremont, and, you know, blue working class communities out there, um, we assumed that maybe there were some deep cultural differences between these places. And that might um, explain this divide that's opened up in blue America. And to understand culture, we really wanted to do something ethnographic and get out there. Um, and, um, and so the book is partly a case for the importance of ethnography as well, especially, especially in this era of, of social uh, and class isolation. Okay. So what, where'd you go? Who'd you talk to? What did you learn? Yeah, we went to three places. We, um, we went to uh, Ottumwa, Iowa, which is a small uh, Rust Belt community and, uh, and uh, has a large meat packing plant. It's got a John Deere factory. It's a classic kind of union Rust Belt town. Uh, we went to um, Elliott County, Kentucky, which is a small rural community uh, in Iowa. 
I mean, I'm sorry, in, in, sorry, it's a small rural community in Appalachia that's very, very isolated and small and poor. Um, and then we went uh, to Johnston, Rhode Island, which is, you know, a spitting distance from where you sit now, Glenn. Indeed. Uh, right? It's a suburb of Providence. Uh, it's very Italian-American. Although, um, John, excuse me for interrupting, I should say, in keeping with your general narrative, I've never been there. <laughs> of course you haven't. <laughs> it's a stone's throw up the highway, and I've never set foot in the place. <laughs> yeah, no, right, right. So, uh, so this isn't always big, giant geographic differences that account for our social isolation, right? Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, yeah, so we went. Uh, uh, it's an interesting point, right? So we went. Um, uh, we went to Johnston, and. Um, you know, all these places in some ways are different. They're economically different. Uh, they're different regions of the country. Uh, there's different urban geographies, you know, um, uh, but they also have certain things in common. They're all, um, uh, you know, incomes are modest. Uh, the percent of, of citizens with college ed- degrees is, is, uh, is low. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and they're overwhelmingly white communities as well. Uh, although some have experienced some in immigration recently, including including Johnston. Excuse me. Let me just ask a methodological question. How did you settle upon these particular sites? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, well, partly we, want, we wanted some diversity. Uh, and, um, and so all these places seem varied along some dimensions um, that I just mentioned. You know, I mean, they're a little bit economically different. Um, um, they were even uh, ethnically a little bit different. Um, um, we also had to pick places, frankly, Glenn, that we could get to. I mean, you know, some of these places are so remote that literally we would, there would have been no place for us to stay, right? There's like no hotel, there's no Airbnb. Um, so that limited us to some degree, you know, some of these places would have been hard to do field work in unless we really knew someone in these communities. Um, um, uh, we wanted to pick places in different, different regions, um, and, um, but, you know, we, and, and we, of course, they're all deep blue places. I mean, they're all, we want, we wanted places that were really democratic strongholds. So they're places that have been loyal to the Democratic Party for a long time, places where all the local officials are Democrats. Um, and, um, and we wanted, uh, so we wanted places that were really one party towns. Uh, and, and all these places fit that bill. Having said that, you know, it could have been, there's a, some arbitrariness to this too, Glenn, right? It could have been different places. And uh, so we have to think about the generalizability of our findings to other cases. What do you do once you've decided you're going to go to Johnston, Rhode Island, and learn what uh, Democrats who voted for blood, how do, you, how do you even get started? Who do you talk to? How, you know, yeah. you just walk into the diner and, and start <laughs> chatting? I don't think so. I think you need a more... Yeah. coherent strategy. I, I, I right. don't do this kind of work. So it, it just, uh, it really interests yeah. me. No, no, it's a great question. And one, uh, one thing I really appreciate you, Glenn, as an economist, is that you appreciate, you have an appreciation for ethnography, uh, which I've learned from watching your show. I wish more political scientists had um, some appreciation for this kind of work. Um, I have to thank Elijah Anderson for that, my dear friend, yes. who, who uh, woke me up to the deep, deep importance of ethnographic inquiry. Yeah, and we'll we'll probably get to, to this later, but he was on my mind uh, as we were doing some of this research because mm-hmm. of honor culture, and um, uh, and I really first learned about honor culture through Elijah Anderson. Um, so quite right. So how did we do it? So um, our, we we did have a method, uh, and and um, we began by contacting really local elites. So these are journalists, party leaders, clergy, union leaders. Um, and they, um, and from these different occupational perches, these people gave us a different angle of vision into these communities, but because they're well situated in the, in in the sort of social center of these places, um, they also were good at introducing us to just sort of more ordinary citizens in these communities. Um, and then the other thing we quickly wanted to do is help identify a social center. You know, a lot of these places have a place that people tend to gravitate around. In Johnston, for example, um, it's a local coffee shop called Brood Awakenings. 
Uh, and I guess it's, I don't know if that's a Rhode Island chain. Uh, there may be some near down the street from you. I don't know, but uh, there's two in Johnston actually, but one is really the social center. Um, in Elliott County, it was a Dairy Queen. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, it was sort of finding like, where do people sit around and chew the political fat and talk to each other where you can not just interview people, but, but do, but, but observe people. And uh, that's really important, I think, if you want to understand the, the social norms of a place. Um, and so anyway, that was more or less our message, our, our method. And, and that mostly worked. I mean, we found um, the, the, hard, the hard place for us to get access to was Elliott County, Appalachia, where there was much more distrust of outsiders. And, um, and that took some time. Uh, you know, they, they had a lot of distrust of you know, these academics on safari, you know, com coming into their community and, and wanting to poke around, which there's a long, long history of in Appalachia. Um, uh, and so that, that took a lot more, um, that took a lot more work. Johnston was easy, you know, it was full of these Italian Americans who, you know, wanted to tell us what they thought about all kinds of things. And so that was an, an easy community to penetrate and to study. You guys did the interviews yourselves? We did. We did the first. Uh, we did the first case together, um, and I should say this too, Glenn, because it's um, so. Stephanie uh, Marabjek and I are also married, so uh, so so we did this kind of as a as a family, and so we studied the first. We studied Johnston together, which was our first case study, and then I did Iowa, and she did the case in in Appalachia. Okay, sounds very interesting. Um, how were you received uh, coming in? You say there was some skepticism in Appalachia. Uh, you guys, I guess, speak a different version of the English language than uh, the locals do down there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was hard. I mean, Stephanie, um, you know, I'm glad she did Appalachia because um, I think she, she, she would have um, had a lot more success at this than I would have had. Um, well, one thing she did is, um, well, her, her first trip there, we almost thought maybe we had to ab abort this case because nobody would talk to her. Um, and, um, and as I mentioned, you know, that was partly there's, it's a, well, first, it's a very insular place. Um, but there's also just a um, sort of history of distrust. And, and there had been some journalists there recently who had parachuted in and found, you know, sort of a local crazy guy. And who everyone knew was sort of uh, nuts and interviewed him and profiled him in in a national newspaper. And so um, so we came on the heels of that experience. Oh, and people were smarting about that because they felt embarrassed or Im poorly represented yes. by that. Yes. So they're very mindful of this. Right. So they said things like you all just think we're a bunch of, of, of rednecks, you know, and that wasn't really a term even our, in our own vocabulary or minds, you know, but it is very much in theirs. Um, you know, they feel um, looked down upon and misunderstood. And, you know, they didn't want some PhD coming into their community and poking around and asking questions. And, and I'm not sure I could blame them. You know, I mean, if I were them, I mean, I think some of that distrust is, is well earned. Um, um, so we almost considered walking away from this project altogether. And uh, but Stephanie went back a second time and she did something really clever. She took our 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 then seven year old son. And uh, this was very humanizing uh, because, you know, it's a very familial place. Uh, and so to see her not just as a nosy academic, but as a mom, uh, you know, really softened them. And now, this place in Appalachia went for Obama twice. Twice, not just that, not just that, Glenn. It had never in its history voted for a Republican, right? I mean, it's really right. extraordinary, right? I'm not sure in the history of, I don't know, you know, democracy, <laughs> there's <laughs> ever been a polity that has voted that consistently for one party, right? So it's a really um, sort of fascinating place. I also think it's the whitest place uh, community in the country that voted for Obama. Uh, basically, you know, there are no uh, there are no people of color in Elliott County. Right. I mean, it's 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 there's six thousand people there and they're all white. In fact, um, there's, you know, only a handful. I mean, most of the citizens there have a handful of surnames. You know, I mean, it's a very 
uh, it's it's a very homogenous place. Right. Yeah, I, I know how the cliche goes. Uh, right, the slanderous cliche. <laughs> yeah, you kind of know you kind of know where that goes, right? Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> so, so to outsiders, it seems kind of very inbred and incestuous, and 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 um, right. Okay, so this is ground zero for your inquiry. Uh, you want to know what happened in 2016. So what what did you what did you learn talking to these people? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that really struck us is how, you know, how familiar Trump really is in these places. A lot of the local political leaders there are Trumpian. You know, they're um, they're uh, brazen, uh, they're thin skinned, uh, they're uh, relentless counter punchers, they're nepotistic. Um, they're not especially ideological. They, they come, uh, they, and, and, you know, they're, they're, the politics there is much more transactional. So they promise to cut deals and corners if needed to sort of take care of their people. Um, and they expect respect, they expect perfect loyalty and respect in return. Um, there is some history of corruption, uh, political corruption in these places. Um, so, um, you know, it was, it's it's a and and this is part this is for a lot of reasons um um and maybe uh we we could work through those right i mean it's partly these are this is a political world that's been shaped by a tradition of honor culture it's been shaped by a kind of familialism where that's common in working class communities it's been shaped by a, a a history of boss politics uh which persisted there much longer than it did in the um you know, major uh, urban centers like Boston and Chicago. Um, so in a funny way, you know, to, to get a glimpse of these, of these places was sort of, it's sort of like getting a glimpse of the old Democratic Party as it used to exist. Um, and it's uh, in, in, you know, uh, in the heyday of urban machines. Um, but it's persisted there for longer, partly because, again, it's been, there's just been fewer foes. Uh, you know, fewer middle class reformers who didn't like this kind of politics. Um, and partly, again, because of its sort of working class uh, sensibilities and culture. Wow. What about unions? Yeah, so unions were strong in, in, uh, in these places, but they're not. Um, um, uh, yeah, they, they, but they're, they're weakened, you know, I mean, and, and um, uh, that's been uh, certainly. Uh, very true in Atumwa. I mean, Atumwa used had a had a powerful uh, tradition of militant unionism. There were uh, uh, the the uh, the union uh, rank and file at its meatpacking plant used to have wildcat strikes, and you know it was it was a very militant local. This is the uh, Iowa town. This is the Iowa town. Yeah, and I was just thinking. I mean, union politics, Democrat. Uh, this is what I think. And so, yep. even though you've got a cultural vector maybe pointing in one direction, why wouldn't the institutionalized political interests of the labor movement uh, outweigh that? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, well, par partly it's because they be, they're just much weaker, you know, and so uh, they don't have the muscle and political power that they used to have. And um, uh, and so they can't, you know, they don't have the power to, um, uh, you know, the kind of political leverage and power that they used to have. Um, but it's also true that Trump really um, uh, spoke to the kind of economic concerns that have historically been at the forefront of unions. You know, I mean, these these folks are more protectionist uh, than typical Democratic voters, for example. Um, and so in some ways he, he, you know, he, um, you know, tr Trump is really sort of expressing the kind of concerns that have driven a kind of union, uh, th these union towns. I see. Okay. Well, so Hillary Clinton was calling these people deplorables. Um, I'm wondering what the thinking was at the top of the Democratic Party that somehow didn't see coming this, uh, I, you know, I don't want to call it cultural backlash or whatever against the party. Um, if it if it weren't Trump, it might have been someone else. Uh, so you know, there's there's Trump, but then there's also what was going on in, um, among the Democrats themselves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this component of their prior constituents. 
Yeah, well, I, I think partly the Democrats had, um, um, you know, sort of assumed these places would continue voting Democratic. And that's not a crazy assumption. Uh, you know, these are places, I mean, you look at a place like Elliott County, you know, it, you don't, um, you know, one one doesn't think it's going to flip uh, to the Republican Party, um, or that that's true of the other places as well. So I think there was sort of, um, you know, just an assumption that these places would continue behaving as they have in the past. Um, and I think what really flipped them uh, in some ways was um, not just democratic neglect, although I think that's a piece of it, but, you know, democratic neglect is sort of an old story that that had been going on a long time. Um, what was new in, was really Trump. And I think he excited these folks uh, in a way that no prior presidential candidate had. I mean, and, and there was a lot of evidence of this in the communities that we looked at. So, for example, in Johnston, um, where, you know, you should you should go uh, visit at, at some point, um, you know, there's there's a um, you know, they were overwhelmed during the primaries because there are all these Democrats who wanted to switch their party registrations so they could support Trump in the primary. Right. So they were completely overwhelmed. Um, this, this, there was a similar story in, in Ottumwa, Iowa. Um, and well, excuse me if you interrupted. Yes. That's, that would be something knowable before the November 2016 election. So a good analyst could have seen the warning flag in the primary registration behavior that would yes. tell them that, oh, my God, we might win Rhode Island. But what about Michigan? What about Pennsylvania? No, I think it's I think it's I think it's I, I think it's true to a point, right? So I think it's a good observation, Glenn, right? So to a degree, um, I think that's right, although the outcome still surprised a lot of the most knowledgeable locals there, right? I mean, people just didn't expect um the kind of um uh you know, despite despite those early signs, uh, there is still just a sense that these places just couldn't possibly go for Trump. And we heard that a lot. You know, uh, we heard local political elites tell us they just they just never thought it was possible. Right. They didn't believe their town uh, could could flip because, again, it had been so solidly democratic. Um, so I think, um, yes, if they were really perspicacious and were really um, uh, didn't sort of assume that these places were um, were would sort of keep keep doing what they had done. Uh, but there, you know, um, um, in retrospect, that seems right, right? They they should have they should have um, they should have taken these signs more seriously than they did. What about Trump so appealed to these people? Yeah, I mean, a part of it is um, he seems like they do and behaves like they do, and 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 um, and that's partly because Trump respects an honor culture. Um, and if your listeners, I'll sort of briefly lay that out, right? So if your yeah. listeners don't know what that is, um, um, you know, in, honor, in an honor culture, it's very important to defend one's social reputation for toughness. Uh, so, you know, you can't let, if, if you're challenged or insulted, it's critical that one punches back and responds, right? You can't, you can't take Michelle Obama's advice, right? So when they go low, we go high. That's not going to work in an honor culture. Because if you follow Michelle Obama's advice in this world, in an honor culture, um, you're going to be exploited, right? Because uh, anytime you go high, uh, it's always going to be read as a sign of weakness, right? Uh, as so a sign that you're not really capable of defending oneself. So it's a kind of culture that's common really throughout the world. Uh, it's common um, in much of the United States. It exists not just in white communities, but in black and brown ones, too. Um, and uh, where it doesn't exist is the kinds of places that lots of, you know, urbane, educated Democrats live. It doesn't, doesn't exist in college towns and, um, and uh, highly educated uh, uh, neighborhoods and urban centers. Um, I mean, it used to be more common, of course. You know, the, the, the play Hamilton reminds us that, you know, our political leaders used to kill each other in duels. Um, but well, I'm actually thinking of Jim Webb more recently, the former senator, the Scotch-Irish uh, inheritance uh, that some uh, argue uh, very much manifested itself in the South and in Appalachia, 
yep. uh, you know. Yep. Yes, and and we and and we associate it with the South, but it also exists in you know in the Italian American community, uh, uh, you know, in Providence and Johnston, um, and in you know Irish communities in Boston. Uh, you know, it's a it's um, so um, it's common throughout the world. We we and and, and the nation we we sort of forget about it. Sounds uh, very male. Excuse me again for interrupting. It sounds yeah. it sounds very macho. Uh, kind of uh, patriarchal. It is. It is. I think that's right. But it's it's um um and it. I think it does sort of appeal to um you know um it's it's a it's it's certainly men are expected especially to be tough, um but it's also um one thing that struck us, Glenn, is that it's also admired by women too. Uh, you know, it's it's uh um. You know, it's it's they they I mean, you know, women are a lot tougher in these communities uh, than uh, than one might think. Um, if for, for those who have read uh, J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy, uh, <laughs> you'll get a flavor for this. Right. Because his grandmother actually his lived still packing grandmother. <laughs> yeah. Right. He had a shotgun at 12, almost shot somebody at 12 because they were trying to steal the, you know, the family cow. And then later she lit her husband on fire, you know, when he had crossed her. Um, so, you know, it, it's <laughs> yes, it's a, it is a masculine style, but it's also because it's a culture. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a broader way of resolving conflict that's practiced by both genders. Um, so we saw a lot of evidence of this culture uh, in these places. We certainly saw it in its politics, uh, in the local politicians who seem very Trumpian. Um, and then we saw it in everyday life, too, you know, in the townspeople. And um, we're hap- I'm happy to give some examples if you think that would be interesting. But let me just make sure I'm understanding this this uh, tendency to want to fight to defend my reputation for toughness this not taking an insult without giving as good as I got uh, th- this this toughness, this belligerence really um, the, the, you're you're identifying that as a fundamental trait of the culture of these places, which they saw reflected in the personality of Donald Trump, uh, and which you argue accounts for their deviating from the long tradition of support for Democrats, uh, because that attraction was so powerful to them. Uh, yeah, we think it's a factor, you know, and, and, and we have, and there's, and there's a couple of kinds uh, well there's a sort of theory here but also which I'll lay out but also a kind of more empirical support for it so on okay. the theory side um you know a lot of voting a lot of voting is driven by a sense of social proximity you know it's it's not so much driven by policy preferences or ideology uh but by a sense that uh you know a candidate really speaks my language right and so trump um, Trump really seemed, I think, to a lot of the people we spoke with, like one of them, right? He sh- he shared this sort of working class sensibility, um, uh, in way of sort of um, uh, uh, you know um, sort of defending himself and and pressing his interest. All, all of this seemed, you know, Trump Trump sort of felt like a working class um, candidate. Um, in a way, I would say he's sort of, um, you know, we, we say that he's really a kind of, um, uh, you know, arguably the sort of the most um, working class modern president, right? In the sense that he, you know, he, he, he violated sort of the norms of the professional class. And one way he did that was through a kind of respect for this culture of honor. Um, so we think that partly there's a kind of, it's a kind of class-based identity, that's going on here, right? There's a sense that, oh, he's, 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 he's one of us, right? He's, this is how we talk on a Saturday night, which, which they sometimes said, right? Or he's, he's, he's part of our universe and therefore we can trust him. The thing, um, that's, the thing that's puzzling me about that though, is that in fact, he's not a working class. He's for a child of privilege. He was born with, how did uh, Ann Richards a, a silver foot in his mouth? I mean, so how, how is, did he know what he was doing? Did 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 uh, Trump just stumble into this, or was this a, a, a affectation of you know 
Uh, I, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you know, and it's one we, we've only thought about recently because as, as interested as we are in Trump voters, we, we, we weren't interested in Trump, right? But then we had to think about Trump. Um, and I think our, our sense of this, Glenn, is that, um, you know, he's, yes, he's, he's, um, he comes from privilege, but you don't want to think about class in just economic terms. I think that's really the wrong way to think about class. You also have to think about social class. And, you know, he came from a, a family um, and moved in a world, uh, sort of the real estate industry, you know, world of, you know, he had to work with sort of mobbed up, right, concrete companies and all the rest in Manhattan. It was a world that was also, I think, shaped by this culture to some degree. Um, I think his m mother is Scotch-Irish background. Uh, you know, he, he I think you know, our sense is that he kind of, he, he grew up with this social, he grew up in a certain social class that happened to get, um, that happened to get um, wealthy. And this is actually true in the towns we looked at. I mean, there were people who were successful business people in these places. You know, they had a family business that did pretty well. They weren't yeah. poor. Uh, by, the by the standards of their community, they were well-to-do, but they all shared this social class. You know, and it's why education in some ways is such a better marker of Trump voting than income, uh, because education is a better marker of this class division that we're really trying to highlight in this book. And if you just think about class in economic terms, I think you miss in many ways the, 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 the way in which this class divide has sort of played out. So, yeah, so I, I uh, so, yeah, so Trump, he's rich, but he's he's I mean, wouldn't you say, Glenn, that um Trump is sort of seen in academic circles as kind of D-class A, you know? I mean, he... Oh, yeah. I mean, for example, he's stupid. The, yeah. the argument that he's stupid, which always befuddled me. People will get mad at me who are listening to this show right now for me not affirming that Trump is stupid. I don't think he's stupid. I don't see how you could have pulled right. off what he's pulled off and be stupid. He may be many things. He may be venal. He may be, you know, wrongheaded. I mean, he may be a racist. I'm not saying he is or he isn't. He could be. But he's, in my opinion, stupid. That's way down the list of things that I would attribute. And yet people crow that he's an idiot. He's a jackass. He doesn't know his head from the hole in the ground. He's a blah, blah, blah. And he doesn't read. <laughs> he doesn't read. You know, they'll, they'll say things like that. And that does feel to me a little bit like playing a cultural card. He's not like us. He's not as refined as us. Look how Obama moved gracefully through the world. He'd feel very fine at a cocktail party on Martha's Vineyard. Trump wouldn't know what to say. Etc. So yeah, I definitely, I definitely uh, see some of what you're what you're getting at there. Yeah, there's a crassness and crudeness to him, you know, that I think is um, a marker of sort of the working class, and that you know, sort of, uh, and that just seems familiar to them, you know, and and it's in in that sense, I think the stuff about the, the emphasis conservatives also place on political correctness sort of misses this a little bit. You know, it's not like these are people who are tuned into, um, you know, the concept of microaggressions or safe spaces or any of that stuff. You know, what they see is a kind of someone who's flouting the norms of the professional class more broadly, you know, which they feel alienated from. But the crudeness sometimes uh, leaks over into meanness and uh, a, a kind of a viciousness, even, you know, shithole countries and, you know, go back where you came from kind of stuff like that. Uh, right. Uh, uh, playing around with uh, the, the, the belligerence and the, the honor, honor stuff sometimes leaches over into uh, almost seeming to foment or wink at uh, that kind of behavior in your followers and things like that. Uh, would you say? Would you say? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's that's right, and it does leak over in these communities too. I mean, the mayor of Johnston, um, you know, we saw this in the mayor there. I mean, you know, he he holds court over a town hall meeting, and he's always greeted by a by a small group of citizens who really dislike his rule, and um, he he just calls them um, malcontents and misfits. And douchebags, you know, it's not, it's not the to the cheers of his supporters. Um, to the yes, they, uh, they, they, they appreciate this style. I think this is critical, right? So they, this is how one should handle conflict. Um, 
and um, and because that's what's respected, right? That's how that's how you deal with someone who's given it to you. Um, is you got to punch back, right? And you you can't be magnan- magnanimous. That's always going to be read as weakness. Um, and so. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, occasionally we heard someone in Johnston say things like, gee, I wish he wouldn't curse at old ladies so much. Um, you know, so at the margins, they, they, <laughs> there's kind of some excesses to it. But, you know, you, you can appreciate something even if you think it can be if there's excesses, right? You think, well, ba- we, we basically like that style. So I'm thinking back to some of these rallies early in the uh, 2016 campaign and then in the administration where the protesters would be protesting and Trump would say, get him out of here. Yes. You know, exactly. whatever. Or where he's giving that speech to the police uh, union uh, fraternity or whatever. And he says, uh, don't be too gentle when you put him into the patty, with you, this kind of thing. You're saying that's a calculated move to appeal to a certain sentiment in a critical part of the electorate that he needs I, to, to win the. I, I, it's a good question. I don't know how calculated it is. Okay. But I do think it's, I do think it might be just authentic to Trump. I mean, he I think he's really a believer in this style. I mean, he once told uh, this is chronicled in Bob Woodward's first book on him, Fear. Woodward, you know, says that Trump once said something to the effect like, you know, um, real power is fear. You can't ever show weakness, never get back down. There is no choice. Right. So for Trump, there's strong people and there's weak people. And there's really and the question is always, are you are you a strong person or are you not? You know, I think it it explains why he he's gravitated to strong men around the world. Um, For example, you know, I I think that's um, I think for Trump, too, there's no other style of leadership, you know, and um, and it may come at his political expense now. Right. I mean, this kind of this kind of style plays well in the communities we visited, but it doesn't play so good in, the, in so well in the suburbs, you know? Um, so I don't know that he can, um, I don't, I don't know that Trump is, Trump seems sort of trapped by this honor culture too, in some ways, you know, he, he doesn't seem to be, there's, there's not a lot of nimbleness there, sort of ability to sort of, you know, nod toward other kinds of cultural sensibilities that are out there. This, the second quick, quick thing I'd say, Glenn, is I think that I think it's a really good point you're making about the rallies. Um, and it's in one and one of the things that stri- stri- really struck us is this honor culture works a lot better locally than it does nationally. You know, I mean, Trump really has tried to import this culture into our national politics and it doesn't it doesn't import well. It works a lot better locally because citizens have a lot of social knowledge in those contexts. You know, they kind of know uh, they kind of know who not to mess with. Um, they can sometimes intervene. Uh, if I mean, we saw this in to give another example from Johnston. I mean, there was a fight that nearly broke out at the local coffee shop there, a political fight between a Clinton supporter and a Trump supporter. But there was a third person who intervened because he knew both would be combatants, right? He knew both parties and sort of vouched for him and said, hey, you're a nice guy. You're a nice guy. Let's let's talk this out. Um, uh, but when you get large rallies uh, and it's basically a group of strangers, um, that same kind of culture uh, doesn't, you know, where there's a lot of strangers, just, you know, it can't moderate. Uh, con- right? con- conflicts tend to go straight to violence. You know, there's sort of no, there's no sort of social knowledge and intimacy that can help um, uh, sort of de-escalate um, those conflicts. Um, so it's it's a culture that um, really doesn't work well at the national level. And one of the one of the terrible things I, we think that Trump has done is sort of imported this sort of local culture into the national orbit. I would we'd say the same thing is true of nepotism. Nepotism isn't so bad in small towns. Doesn't work so well, uh, uh, you know, in uh, at the national level. Um, I'm just thinking about that point. That seems very interesting to me. There, the, on the one hand, the imperative at the level of an individual to maintain a reputation for toughness. Don't mess with me. On the other hand, that could lead to a lot of unnecessary conflict unless modulated by some other forces or customs or practices, but in order to cultivate these mitigating uh, uh, conflict diminishing 
uh, norms and practices, we need to know each other. Right. 300 million people can't know each other in the same way. What you say on CNN or from the White House with a tweet, uh, which goes right. out to 100 million people, is a different thing than what you say in a bar when you've got a beef with somebody because he sat on yep. your regular bar stool. Yep. Kind of thing like that. That's that's yeah, all very and, interesting. And, and, and you see this, Glenn, in a book that I know you're a fan of, um, you know, Elijah Anderson's Code of the Street. You know? I do love that book, yes. It's an excellent, excellent book. And one of the great, many great insights in that book is the ways in which the Code of the Street, um, you know, can sometimes... Uh, uh, control violence too, limit it. You know, there's a way in which it can, uh, because there is all this social knowledge and, and intimacy. Um, and I guess the, the, the final thing I'd say on this, Glenn, is that, you know, there's a lot of the critics of Trump accused him of violating the norms of politics. Um, but what he really did is he violated the norms of our national politics. And, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of these local communities, politics is much more Trumpian. And um, and um, and so Trump doesn't seem so odd in these places. You know, he's he's uh, and so if we dismiss him, uh, you know, as just this sort of disordered kind of crazy person, we miss all the ways in which he behaves totally normally, <laughs> you know, in 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 a lot of sort of local context. Um, and I, I think that's, a, you know, important thing to keep in mind as we're trying to make sense of his his appeal. Okay, well, here's the question uh, that I have to ask. What about race? Yes. Okay, these people voted for Obama in these counties that you're talking about. So I want to say they're not racist. They could get behind Obama. On the other hand, they flip and they vote for Trump. And Trump is well known to be, quote unquote, a racist. Uh, Why is it that Trump's racism didn't uh, turn them off? Or did their votes for Obama really betray something uh, more uh, egalitarian or open about race? Uh, or, you know, or was it a flu? Something like that. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, we're, you know, we, we think there may be some, I mean, we, we, we certainly don't want to dismiss the claim that there, that race was a factor. I mean, I, um, um, I, I guess we just wish there would be more intellectual humility on the part of those who insist that race was everything. You know, I, I, I that's, that's what we're not, really persuaded by. I mean, um, I mean, I think one of the takeaways from our book is that, um, is that white identity cannot be these folks only social identity, right? Uh, they're much more three-dimensional than that. And it can't be their only identity, partly because of the reason you just gave. It doesn't really explain, you know, why they would vote for Obama twice if they were merely, you know, white identity was sort of the, their only sort of central and, and, and only important kind of political and social identity. Um, but um, uh, so we think they're much more three dimensional. You know, I mean, I think that um, in addition to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what it, however much they identify as white people, um, they also um, have these strong class based identities. Um, they're, they're also really connected to their place. And, and we also talk about this in the book. You know, they really deeply identify um, as Atumwans and Johnstonians and Elliott Countians. Uh, their, sense of, their sense of self and identity in some ways is really, inextric- it really deeply connected to that town. You know, and it's really, um, and it's really, um, and when I tell this to some of my colleagues, Glenn, they sometimes say, well, you know, Democrats in Boston are, they care about where they live. You know, they're good neighborly people. They go, they're good localists. Um, and that's true as far as they go. But those people in Boston, in Brookline, Massachusetts, for example, they would be equally at home, you know, in Old Town, Alexandria, or in Palo Alto, California. Yeah. Um, or in Claremont, right? But but the Boston Democrats who live in Southie would not be. That's right. That's right. Right. So uh, that's right. So you know the the Johnstonians we studied would be totally out of place in Elliott County, you know, and the Elliott Countyans would feel totally out of place in Ottumwa because the place they live is really where they're socially known, right? It's it's the place where uh, they have a reputation. Uh, where they have deep family ties, um, where um, where their 
really whole social identity is, is, is centered. Um, I think it's sort of the opposite for the professional class, right? Like if we, you know, if you went and took a job at Harvard, right, um, you might, or if I did, right, that would enhance our social reputation. Um, and um, whereas for them to leave their hometown would be a kind of social death, you know, they would uh, be disconnected from the community in place that gives them a sense, that gives them, really anchors them. And um, I mean, very uh, poignantly, you see this in Elliott County where uh, streets are named after their families, you know, where all their dead are buried on their property. Um, and um, so in addition to these racial identities, I guess, Glenn, we would also say that they have deep sense of, of class and place. And, um, and we don't know really for sure, you know, what, how to weigh these various factors. Uh, yeah, that is, and, and that's partly because political science scientists really haven't tried to measure a lot of this stuff. You know, there's, if you look at the National Election Survey, there's a ton of questions on race, um, but no really effort to measure people's place-based identities. There's, there's no effort to measure their sense of uh, social class. Um, and, um, but our intuition based on our research is that, um, you know, our impression, you know, based on just on our impressionistic work is that, that's that race is, is overstated, you know, that, um, uh, there's been too much emphasis on this and, um, and we don't, we don't think it really, um, um, I mean, in a way, right, maybe this is the last thing I'll say, I mean, in a, in a way, I mean, you know, white identity, it's, I mean, white America is almost too broad a category, right, to capture their identities. I mean, their identities in some ways are more provincial in certain ways, you know, like they're, you know, they're a Tom ones, you know, or they're, they're Johnstonians. Um, or, or they're, they're hunters, Tom- or they're hunters, or, or they're Catholics, I'm asking. Is religion yeah. a part of it? Or are the social issues, the Second Amendment, abortion, et cetera? It's a lot weaker than we anticipated. I mean, that first of all, the church is weakening in all these places. Uh, so these are communities that are secularizing fast. And um, and the church is, uh, you know, I mean, the church in all these places in some ways is, a, is I mean, I, I also don't want to describe these, we also don't want to describe these places as culturally homogenous, right? I mean, the church in some ways is, a, is really sort of pushing against these local honor cultures too, right? Because the church says good Christian men should turn the other cheek and, yeah. you know, all that stuff. So there's a, um, but, but the church is, um, um, is, is weakening there as our unions. Um, and, um, and that's relevant too, because a lot of the commentators on these folks said, oh, they voted for Trump because they're so alienated, you know, from all these civic institutions, which used to sort of give them a sense of identity, um, uh, and I do think they're worried about that, the decay of these institutions, um, but it's precisely because they're not alienated from the places they live, right? I mean, they're deeply, they care about them, uh, and, uh, they're worried about their, uh, their fate. And Trump came along and said, you know, I'm going to make America great again. And when they, when they heard that, what they really heard is we're, you know, I'm going to make a Tumwa great again, and I'm going to make Elliott County great again. And, um, you know, that kind of restorationist rhetoric resonated in communities that are facing existential threats, right? I mean, there, there are worlds in which a lot of the young people have left. Yeah. There's a concern that they'll be able to just sustain these communities, which are so important to their sense of self. Okay, I know you got to go, uh, John, but I got to I gotta do this to you. I'm sorry. We're talking here a few days on the Thursday before Election Day. But uh, the viewers are not going to see this until after the election. So can you do it again? Um, well, that's a, um, it doesn't look that way, right? I mean, um, that's what the polls are telling me, but they said the same thing last time. Yeah, right. I mean, I've, 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 you know, um, I've underestimated him from the beginning. Uh, and he's consistently proven me wrong. So it's been, it's been humbling in some ways to make predictions about Trump and his political prospects. I, I, I suspect uh, I suspect that Biden will win, but and he he probably will claw back some of the kinds of folks we studied. But my 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 guess is our guess is is that a lot of the places we studied 
uh, will uh, will vote for Trump again. Um, and I, I think and so the bigger if that happens, the bigger question on our mind is sort of what are the you know, what kind of lessons do Democrats take away from this? You know, uh, you know, what what if they win? Uh, and uh, and uh, despite the fact that they lose a lot of these Obama Trump counties, um, they might then decide, well, gee, I guess we don't need, need these folks after all. Right. And who wants them because they're kind of deplorable and racist and it'd be better, you know, we'll just kind of wash our hands of them and worry about and they're declining anyway. And, you know, um, you think, think that would be a mistake? I think for two reasons. I think one is um, I think one is, first of all, they're although they're in decline, uh, they're uh, they are they're very well represented in the kinds of states that Democrats need to win presidential elections. Um, but also they have to worry about, um, you know, not everything is about the White House, you know, and they need to, if you're a Democrat, it seems to us, you need to worry about, um, you know, your, your influence in state and local governments. But I also think, and I guess this is the bigger thing for us too, Glenn, is that um, the Democrats, uh, there's a lot of ways they can win this election, you know, and they might, and they might well win, you know, by, just increasing turnout among suburbanites and racial minorities, but they still have to ask themselves a kind of more existential question, which is what kind of party do they want to be, right? Do they still want to be a party, a broad-based party of the working class and try to reassemble, right, the, the, um, the, the, the sort of New Deal party, a party that was rooted in the American working class? And to do that, uh, they have to start. Um, that's a that's a big. If they, if they if they really do want to, you know, become that kind of party, they've got a lot of work ahead of them. And it seems to us the place to start is at least start with the places that, you know, um, uh, were basically voting their way until yesterday. You know, I mean, places where still a lot of the local politicians are Democrats, um, and um, and therefore, you know, of course they should they should buy and read our book. Well, I hope should the Democrats when they do do that. I'm smiling here because I'm thinking your your question, what kind of party do the Democrats want to be, is a question that many people will have been putting to the Republican Party for a while now. What kind of party? <laughs> and whatever happens in this election, both parties are going to be thinking in a very deep way about whether uh, our party for the future. Anyway, John, thanks. I know you got to go. Uh, Glenn Lowry here with John Shields, who teaches politics at Claremont McKenna and whose book with Stephanie Moravchik uh, is uh, Trump's Democrats. Um, definitely not too late to read it before the election. <laughs> Actually, yes, it is because we're past the election. <laughs> thanks, John. Thanks, Glenn. I appreciate it.